Welcome to this presentation. Today we're going to discuss Chapter 10 Discovery, and the particular part we're going to discuss is interrogatories. This is the third part of our lecture series on discovery. So let's begin. So let's begin kind of with some basic ideas about interrogatories. I guess the first thing to figure out is what is an interrogatory? Well, it has, an interrogatory has several different features. Um, first of all, they are questions. And you can tell from the beginning of the word interrogatories, we have the word interrogate. A little bit like how the police might interview or interrogate a uh, possible uh, suspect in a crime. Um, we distinguish these types of questions from a, a, depo a deposition because they are in writing versus being oral. So we have written questions. That's a pretty good definition of interrogatories. Now, obviously, when the police do interrogatories, when they interrogate someone, these are typically oral questions. So the term interrogatory does not uh, always mean written questions. They just mean written questions in this context. It's one of the things that's always important to keep in mind when you're dealing with any specialized vocabulary, be it legal or, I don't know, musical or any other discipline, is that many times the, uh, the language will take a word that is an ordinary conversation and either make the term broader or make the term more narrow or just make the term different in some respect. Um, and so it's being used in a specialized way. So your, your initial understanding of that word may not be completely on base, even though it may be a word that you use every day in ordinary conversation. So when we talk about interrogatories here, we're talking about written questions. And um, not surprisingly, because they're written questions, they have to be answered in writing. There's another important aspect to interrogatories that are not included in this definition, and that is that they must be answered under oath. So usually we think about these being the qualifications. Written questions answered under oath and in writing. That gives us a pretty solid definition. We're going to look at Rule 33 to see exactly how interrogatories are governed by the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. You don't need to know this rule number. The only rule number you need to know for this course is Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 11, which has to do with uh, sanctions and signing documents. But I always like to look at the actual rule so we get in the habit of going to our primary sources when we're trying to figure out how we're supposed to do a certain thing in the law. It's very easy as a legal professional to kind of trust what other people tell you, but at the end of the day, your client is entitled to you diving into the documents, you figuring out what it says. Yes, read what other people say, but confirm that information. There can be a lot of reasons why you want to confirm it. One is that the person may just be wrong. A second reason, which is perhaps more likely, is that what the person is saying is dated, that there's been some change in the rules since that time. And finally, the person may be right and the, their information may be up to date, but they may be um, answering a question that is not exactly the question that you have. And so when you go into the rules, you may see that, oh yeah, what they're saying is true, for that particular circumstance, but it's not true for my particular circumstance. So let's go ahead and look at Rule 33. So I'm going to go into the rules. And I'm using the, the Cornell uh, tool. There's lots of different tools out there you can use. We're going over here to Rule 33, three interrogatories, two parties. And of course, you, we haven't covered this yet, but interrogatories are always two parties. So you can't send interrogatories to non-parties. And here's our rule. We can see, and this is a very common way for the rules to be organized. We see a, a heading in general. So this gives you an overview of what's an interrogatory and how does it work. And then we have information about how you um, are gonna answer those particular questions. So this is the entire length of the rule. It's not a very long rule. Let's go through the parts. The first part is the number. And we can see here, let me go ahead and get a little marker going here, is that we're restricted to 25 questions, including all discrete subparts. We'll see more about this in the uh, PowerPoint going forward. Um, that's the usual rule. However, by agreement or by court order, there is the potential 
to have additional interrogatories. In your standard case, you're not going to need more than that, but imagine that you were dealing with a class action with, you know, 5,000 uh, plaintiffs. You can see how there might be very, very complex issues over uh, several different topics, or it could be just a very sophisticated um, uh, a contract where, you, where, where various uh, moving pieces fit together. It just wouldn't be possible to get all the information you need within 25 questions. So um, it's okay, perfectly okay, if sometimes you need more than that, but just keep in mind, don't ask them without getting leave to do so. Let's look at the scope. And the interrogatory may relate to any matter that may be inquired to under Rule 26B. And we've already had a lengthy discussion about 26B and its requirement that it be relevant. It, as you may recall, it doesn't have to be admissible. It could be hearsay or fit into some other exception. Of course, it can't be privileged. Um, that's an exception. An interrogatory is not objectionable merely because it seeks for an opinion or a contention that is related to fact or the application of fact of law to fact. But the court may order that the interrogatory need not be answered until designated discovery is complete or until a pretrial conference or some other time. So this gives us an overview of how we ask the questions. And now we're going to go to answers and objections. And this is for the responding party, so the person who's receiving the interrogatories needs to do things. First of all, the question must be answered by the party to whom they're directed. So we're talking about a party, not a witness, not somebody who is just involved in the dispute but is neither the plaintiff nor the defendant. Another thing that's important is this doesn't say the lawyer or the paralegal for the party. The party is ultimately responsible for signing the documents. They're sworn statement. So you, the paralegal, or you, the attorney, cannot sign the documents for the party. They have here, if the party is a, is a corporation or some other person that isn't a human being, obviously a, a corporation can't sign anything. So we need an officer, an agent of that corporation who's going to um, uh, sign the actual document. So we need a human being, in other words, to sign a document. No big surprise there. What's the time to provide? Well, it's 30 days after being served. You, obviously, the interrogatory must, to the extent it is not objected to, be answered separately and fully in writing under oath. Let's pause and talk about this, because we're going to talk about objections going forward. When you make an objection, and you very likely will object to most, if not all, of the interrogatories that you receive in your, as, as you uh, complete your answers. But the fact that you make an objection doesn't mean, okay, I have an objection, and maybe you have an awesome objection. Boy, that question is overly broad and unduly burdensome. So I'll make my objection, I won't answer any. That's not the way it works. What you do is you make your objection at the beginning of your answer, and then below you answer it, the question to the extent that you feel that you are legally required to. So let's say that they ask for uh, the last 100 years, let's say it's to a uh, corporation, they want the data from the last 100 years on a particular topic. Well, very likely that is overly broad and newly burdensome, but you might say, we think three years is reasonable. And so then you produce the answers for those three years. Now, ultimately, the person asking questions may say, no, we think five years is reasonable, or seven years, or 10 years, or maybe we think all 100 years are reasonable. Um, and so they may then go ahead, file a motion to compel, and you may be in court. But if you objected to the 100 years, which you know, seems pretty patently unreasonable, but you didn't provide any answer, the court's going to be mad at you more so than the person asking the question because you basically had to like, well, the data was completely inappropriate to ask for, and you didn't even provide any answer. So you want to make sure that you're providing a reasonable answer. I mean, it, it, let's say that really under the circumstances, there's a three, three years or five years might be reasonable that you could imagine a court saying that three years is enough. Well, then it's okay for you just to provide the three years. But if common sense says, you know what, really five years is kind of the bare minimum. You ought to go up to five years. You ought to uh, not be so parsimonious as to give a level of data that is really unreasonable. And of course, that's going to turn on the facts. Every case is different. And, um, objections. The grounds for objection to interrogatory must be stated with specificity. Any ground not stated in a timely fashion is waived. And that's why in most answers to interrogatories, for each interrogatory, there's going to be that initial section where you list objections. And then, of course, there has to be a signature. The person who, who answers them must sign them. 
So the person answering signs them, again, it's signed under oath, and the attorney who makes any objections must sign any objections. So the party doesn't sign the objections unless, of course, the party is pro se, and then, of course, he would be making his own objections. Okay, how can they be used? Well, no big surprise here, may be used to the extent allowed by the Federal Rules of Evidence. Um, they can be used for, for lots of different purposes, uh, a useful, de definitely a useful tool. And then here's, here's the option we'll talk about later. This is the option to produce business records. We'll talk about this later on in this presentation. So we'll bookmark this for future uh, use or future uh, utility. Okay, so now let's go back to PowerPoint. Here we go. Okay, so we've talked about Federal Civil Procedure 33. Let's look at some more basics. They, meaning interrogatories, may be propounded, in other words, written and prepared and presented to the other side, may be propounded only to a party to a lawsuit. So if you're the plaintiff, you can send interrogatories to another plaintiff, um, a, a defendant, uh, or even a third party defendant, lots of different people, but they are somebody who's basically on the caption. Their purpose, meaning the interrogatory's purpose, is to obtain basic factual data from other parties. So again, you know, because the, the other side has 30 days to respond to this, and because attorneys and paralegals can be involved, you're not going, you're going to get a lot of data potentially, but you're not going to get unfiltered data. You're going to get a lot of information and expecting um, to trip somebody up or to do something along those lines. I mean, that's something that can happen in a deposition, true, because those are the unfiltered comments of the witnesses. But in interrogatories, um, the uh, paralegals and attorneys will be looking to, uh, to make objections and to fashion the responses in such a way that you're not likely to get a lot of um, unfiltered information or um, not kind of carefully considered responses to questions. So um, useful, certainly, but it's going to be somewhat basic. And this is the type of thing that we're likely to see. The identities of folks. Um, let me go ahead. And, um, uh, the identities of witnesses, very common to list you know, the people that you think are witnesses, because, and you list not just their names, but also where to find these people, um, their email, their telephone, their fax number, their physical address, um, and also what information they can provide. Um, they saw the car accident. They were a witness to the breach of contract, um, whatever the particulars might be, so that when we look at the list of names, you know, we might have 50 names. We might say, oh, well, you know, we don't need to talk that witness because that witness is going to say something that, that we're not interested in. Oh, but we really do need to talk to witness 47 because that's somebody who has some information we really need. So again, you're, when you're drafting your questions, you want to ask it, all of those types of questions. Then we want to know what documents exist and where to find them. Very likely we're going to use this information to uh, do a request for production of documents or data. Um, in fact, very often people who uh, send out interrogatories at the same time in pairing up with the interrogatories do a request for production. So in one interrogatory, you might request the location and contents and names of documents, and then in the request for production, you might actually request those same documents. And then we have the contentions of parties. You may recall that we were just talking about contentions and opinions. You might say, well, Gosh, that doesn't seem very fair. We have to give up our legal theory. Well, that's part of discovery. We have to share not just the cold, hard facts, but also what we're planning on doing with those facts in front of that jury. Um, and what we think, for example, let's say our position in the case is, our position is, let's say it's a breach of contract case and we're the plaintiff. Our position is that the defendant breached the contract first, so our breach is not the problem. So we're not really contesting that we, the plaintiff, eventually breached, but we're saying the defendant breached first. Well, that's a different argument than we never breached at all. The defendant's the only person who breached. And so, again, that's an example of a contention you, you want to know because if the plaintiff is going to admit that, in fact, it eventually breached, um, 
then you you as a defendant kind of know where to invest it. You don't have to worry about proving up that the plaintiff did ultimately breach. We're gonna the plaintiff's gonna admit to that fact. Okay, uh, the maximum number we already talked about, it's 25, including discrete subparts. And of course, when we're talking about subparts here, um, so you, know, you can't just number 25 and each one of your 25 questions, you have 10 subparts. Well, that's, you know, 250 questions. Um, and the fact that you actually don't label them, you know, question one, a question 1b question 1c, the fact that you don't actually separate them in that way uh, isn't what the court's going to focus on. The, fo the court is going to focus on the content, not the form of the request. And so you, you ought to be somewhat careful about how you approach that. And of course, if you go over the 25, well, before you do so, you're going to want to get either the agreement of the other side or the court's agreement. Um, a useful thing to keep in mind is that there are certain disclosures, we've already talked about the certain disclosures that are automatic that, you, that neither party has to actually request in order for the other side to be required to provide that data. And they're, they're pretty good uh, questions that, I mean, they're definitely ones that you're going to want to know the answer to. So you won't want to eat up your 25 questions by just repeating some information that you've already received or that you're going to receive from the other side. Obviously, when we're talking about these questions, most of the time um, the parties are going to have, um, or you as, as the questioner, you are going to have um, you are going to have um, models to work from. I apologize, I got a little distracted there for a second. Um, you're going to have models to work from and let's say your practice you're on the plaintiff side and um, you do a lot of breach of contract cases well you're going to have set interrogatories that you use almost all the time in those cases each time you use interrogatories form interrogatories you're going to look them over i mean in a minute we're going to have to switch out the names of parties uh, make sure your pronoun usage is correct if it's a he in one case it might be a she in the next for example um, dates need to be changed, locations need to be changed, entity names need to be changed, and also a particular facts of, of you know, w w what the contract was about, you're going to need to change. So there definitely will be tweaking of even form interrogatories, but it's helpful to start with that type of content. That way you can uh, customize it, but you're not starting from scratch. Um, and starting from scratch has a several challenges frankly for the person drafting the number one obviously it takes a lot more time if you have to think about what's all the stuff we need to know um, to, to come up with that is going to be much more lengthy um, time commitment than ordinarily propounding interrogatories would be and of course in our business time is money and uh, your client isn't going to want to pay for that money and even if you're on the plaintiff side and you have a contingency fee the attorney isn't going to want for you to devote unnecessary time to the development of those interrogatories but probably an equally good reason we want to use form interrogatories or form questions is that we're, we might miss something, you know, as brilliant as you are and as brilliant as your legal team is, um, it is helpful to know what other people have thought of might be a useful question in this situation. And as soon as you ask them, and let's say you eat up all 25 of your questions and you realize, oh, how stupid, why didn't I ask X? Well, it's too late now, you've already used up your 25 questions. And so you wanna be uh, clever about that. You wanna make sure that you aren't, um, wasting a question or wasting all of your questions when there's something that you're missing that's that's really really important okay uh, we already talked about the 30 days of service now if you send these through some method other than hand delivery it actually becomes 33 days because we have to add three days for mailing so you want to keep that in mind and it's important to calendar these things whether you are the propounder or the recipient 
because um, if you're the propounder, you want to know when you can expect to get those answers because getting those answers may be important in when you're going to schedule depositions and things like that. I mean, you don't want to schedule a deposition before you get the interrogatory responses because you're not going to be able to be as prepared. Um, you're not going to be able to say, well, you know, in your answer to interrogatory 27, you say blah, 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 blah. Well, you know, tell us more about that or whatever that your particular response is. Um, also, you want to have the date so you know if you don't get them on the date that you might need to file a motion to compel. Obviously, if you're the recipient, you need to calendar it so you don't miss that important deadline. Obviously, the parties can agree to modify the date, um, and usually that's done in a pretty collegial manner. Um, hey, and you call up the other side, hey, I got your interrogatories. Well, you know, I'm about to give birth, um, and so can I have an extra you know, 20 days or whatever. Uh, most of the time, unless there's a really good reason, the other side's going to be agreeable to that. We do that out of professional courtesy. We also do it out of some informed self-interest because um, if we are play hardball in that respect, then sometime in the future when we need a little bit of slack because we're in two trials or we have a health issue or uh, some other uh, issue might come up in our professional lives, um, well, the other side's not going to be very willing to give us some slack under those circumstances. Obviously, if the two parties can't agree to fix the, the due date, then, of course, the court may be brought in. And very likely, if someone's about to give birth, the court's going to be like, eh, it's not probably too reasonable to expect a lot of um, interrogatory answering, you know, while you're being induced. <laughs> so, um, so a rule of reason definitely applies. And it's usually a good idea um, not to pick those fights because the judge is developing an opinion, although very likely you'll be in front of the magistrate, so the, the actual judge here in your case is not likely to hear discovery disputes, but even then the word will trickle back. Oh, wait a second. You know, they weren't very reasonable about that. Well, I don't really like that philosophy. I don't like that approach. And you lose some credibility before the court, so when you file your motion for summary judgment, they may look upon you with a bit of a jaundiced eye and maybe not take what you have to say quite as seriously as you would otherwise like them to take it. Okay, so let's talk about preparing interrogatories. I've kind of already given you a preview of some of this. Um, we've already talked in, a, in the part two, so in our previous lecture about, we've talked about the basic format. You know, we talked about the caption and the, the two box, and we talked about how we have a little bit of an introduction or a preamble, and then we talk about the definitions and instructions, and then we go into the substance of the questions. And of course, we have our signature block and our certificate of service. So we have all of those parts that we have in interrogatory. If you need a little refresher on that, please go back and check out either the PowerPoint slides or the lecture. Um, that's uh, lecture number two in this series. Um, interrogatories don't have to literally be questions, so you don't have to have a question mark at the end. It could be something like give all the reasons or state, um, list the documents or whatever. So don't worry about phrasing it as, you know, what are the documents? You I mean, you can. You can phrase this legitimate question if you wish. But don't get uh, focused on that. The important thing is that the content be um, seeking information, not the, the format of the, the wording of the question. So here are the common things that we see in interrogatories. We've kind of already talked about this, the identity of the person who's providing the information. Now, um, you might think, well, we know who that person is. It's the party. It's the person who's signing the interrogatories at the end. And certainly you would expect that person's name to be listed, but especially if um, the party is a corporation or some uh, legal abstraction, there's likely to be lots of different people who have contributed information. Let's say that this was a big corporation. We'll say it was Exxon who's being sued. Well, um, and you have chosen, let's say it's an employment discrimination case. So you've chosen the HR manager to be the person who's going to sign the interrogatories. But there are all kinds of questions about uh, the profitability of the corporation, how data is stored uh, by the corporation, all kinds of things that HR manager has no personal knowledge of. It doesn't even, you know, know what, what the issues are with respect to that. So you, the paralegal, or the attorney is, are going to be in the trenches digging up that information and talking to maybe hundreds of people in some cases, certainly dozens of people in many cases, getting that information. And you'll need to list those people who helped you gather the information. Um, it might be someone in IT or in the um, a financial department, might be somebody in sales, or might be an engineer. I mean, all kinds of different things depending upon the facts of the case. 
So this list could be quite long. Whether the party, if a defendant, so, uh, so this is when the, when the plaintiff has propounded discovery to the defendant. And of course, plaintiffs can file discovery against other plaintiffs and defendants can file discovery against other defendants. So it doesn't necessarily follow that it's a plaintiff file, or a propounding discovery to a defendant or a defendant propounding discovery to a plaintiff. But for the sake of this class, that's kind of how this lecture is going to proceed. So we have a defendant. He's received the discovery. Has he been sued in its correct name? So let's say, I'll give you an example. When I was at JCPenney, I can't tell you how many times people sued this entity. Penny, like something, uh, 100 of which makes a dollar. Well, of course, you know, Penny has an E in it right here. I had even got lawsuits that describe Penny like this. Pennies. Um, you know, or, or they forget, they say J.C. Penny, uh, which is what always seemed funny to us in the legal department because, of course, um, J.C. Penny was the founder of J.C. Penney's. His name was James Cash Penny, and uh, he uh, founded the corporation in 1903. So guess what? He's been dead now for several months. <laughs> um, uh, you probably shouldn't be suing a dead person. Um, not the most useful way of, of uh, advancing your lawsuit. So you'll sometimes see uh, silly things like that along the line. So, but it's good for the plaintiff to, to make sure it's the correct name because obviously at the end of the day, the plaintiff wants to win the lawsuit and then wants to be able to collect a judgment against the defendant. Well, if you sue the wrong person, you're not going to be very lucky at getting that, that, uh, uh, that judgment collected. So this is a smart question to ask. Um, especially if it's a defendant. Now, you don't really care if, I mean, if plaintiff presumably has named himself correctly in the matter and the defendant isn't, unless, of course, the defendant has a counterclaim against the plaintiff, the defendant isn't going to be able to uh, get any type of, of remedy against the plaintiff, well, maybe court costs and things. So I guess it's possible, but presumably the plaintiff has listed its name correctly. Potential parties are not already named in the lawsuit. Maybe other defendants or other plaintiffs. Uh, that could be helpful information. Maybe they're going to need to be third-partied into the lawsuit or some other um, issue might be addressed with them. Uh, certainly, they could be fact witnesses. We've already talked about the, getting the identities and contact information of anyone who has information and also what particular information they might have. Um, of course, we're already going to see this in the Rule 26 disclosure, so you don't want to eat up one of your questions here, but just be aware that this is the type of question you definitely need the answer to. Um, the existence and locations of any data, and of course, where I talked about uh, opinions and contentions. Important stuff for sure. This is our caption. We've already talked about the caption. As you can see, it's not going to be any different than the caption for the complaint or the answer or in fact, the responses to interrogatories. And then here we have our two line. You can see it's addressed to the plaintiff uh, through his attorney. Obviously, if Buford T. Justice was pro se, meaning representing himself, we would just list to Buford T. Justice plaintiff at his address. And then we have this little preamble, this little introduction. Again, you don't have to use these words or anything magical about it, but we can see here defendant, Bert T. Bandit, serves these interrogatories on plaintiff, Buford T. Justice, as authorized by Federal Civil Procedure 33. That's that rule we were just looking at. Plaintiff must serve an answer to each of these, each interrogatory separately and fully in writing and under oath within 30 days of service. Again, we already saw the 30 days, but remember we also saw it's very possibly going to be 33 because of the way the method of service. And then we have our signature block. This is going to be the exact same signature block that we've had in the complaint and the answer um, and any other documents that are filed. Very common structure here. Um, what's important is the data. It's not necessarily important to be presented in this way, although this is, I think, an attractive way. We can see that we have respectfully submitted. We have a place for the signature. We have this Texas State Bar number. And you, again, you may think, well, that's kind of surprising because you don't have to be a member of the Texas State Bar in order to be a member of the federal court. And obviously, if you're not a member of the Texas State Bar, you're probably going to list either your federal bar number or whatever state bar number you might have.
but I would say probably 95% of the time it'll be this Texas State Bar number. Then you're going to have a physical address, you're going to have a telephone number, a fax, and an email address, and it's also appropriate to list this, um, who, who you are representing in this particular case. And again, this you're not going to reinvent the wheel. This is probably going to be your, uh, uh, you'll probably have a separate file. You as a paralegal probably have a separate file for Carrie Frog, and you can just cut and paste this into whatever document that you have. Obviously, you wouldn't cut and paste this part because this part is going to change with every uh, case, although I suppose for this particular case, you could have this in here. Um, so again, look for ways to save yourself from typing unnecessary information. So after we have this pre preamble, and of course this is out of order, typically people are going to put um, the, uh, the signature block at the end, so the subscription at the end of the document obviously. So this is a little bit out of order. We'd really be looking to now, after we've done the preamble, to go into the instructions. And again, as, as the propounder, you're going to want the instructions to be very broad to capture as much data as possible. So let's see how this particular um, drafter uh, accomplished that fact. When asked to identify a document, please state the date of the document. And you might change to say the date the document was created. That's probably how I would say it. The name, job title, and address the person who prepared it. The name, address, and job title to whom it was addressed. Obviously, you just type over here, should be one word. Or circulated, or who saw it. This I don't think is very, I'll probably make this a separate category, and who saw it. So I mean, it might be sent to person A, but person B, C, and D were CC'd on it, and persons E, F, and G were B, C, C'd on it, and persons H, uh, J, K um, were forward the document. And it was put up on a PowerPoint slide for uh, these other 10 people when they were in a meeting. So you'd, you'd want to, I think, be a little bit clearer about that one. The name, address, and job title. Missing a, a serial comma here. Sorry about that. Um, of the person now in possession of the document. This makes sense if it's actually a piece of paper. Um, so someone can have a copy of it. But if it's a piece of data, that, that term may not make sense and a description of the subject matter of the document. Now, obviously, it's very likely that when you're talking about a document that you're also going to propound a request for production, get the document. And as we'll talk about in a few minutes, it's very likely the person answering these interrogatories will say, at least with respect to um, this one and this one and this part of this one, you can just say, hey, we're just giving you the document. You can read it for the, for the date. You can see for yourself what it says. Now, some of these other things, though, you, you, you it won't be obvious on the face of it, necessarily all of this information. When asked to identify a person, please state the person's full name, his or her present or last known residential address, his or her present or last known, sorry about that, residential and business office, or office telephone numbers, and uh, all of this information. Now, if the person is represented in the particular matter or is, uh, qualifies as an agent of the corporation, usually, uh, for example, this is an employee of the corporation who's being sued, you're probably not going, you're going to provide the person's name, but you're probably going to just provide the name of the attorney because it would not be appropriate for the other side to be getting data directly from basically the client. Um, but if this person, say, saw the car accident and isn't being represented by the law firm and isn't a part of the entity that's being sued, then you would provide this information to the extent that you know it. Now we have definitions. Again, as a propounder, you're focused on very broad definitions, but you want it to be sufficiently precise that the other side knows exactly what you want to get at. And you can see here, typically the terms being defined are going to be put in quotation marks. Many times they will be capitalized. I would say that's probably a better practice to do that. Okay, plaintiff, you, or your, or any combination or portion thereof shall each mean referred to and include plaintiff Buford T. Justice and his agents, representatives, and all other persons or entities acting in concert with him or under his control, whether directly or indirectly, including any attorney or legal assistant, agent, employee, representative, or principal. 
and you can see here if the plaintiff were Sally Justice, well, we'd have to change this to a her. Um, it, sometimes people will actually make these definitions a gender neutral, so we might say his or her, so we don't, it, it's his or her, so we don't have to worry about changing it every time. And again, so this is an example. So it's not just when we say plaintiff, it's not just this human being, but it could be a broader universe of people. That getting it broad, having it have a more expansive definition, but that is also <clears throat> specific enough so that if the, uh, the, the answerer does not uh, follow the definition, you can say, well, they did not fully comply with the discovery request is what you want. So you want it to be broad, but you want it also to be specific. The accident shall mean and refer to an automobile accident involving plaintiff and defendant occurring on this date, on this street, in this city. And so that's a good example. You don't want to have to constantly be repeating this term. Also, if you use it in the definition section, if your practice, say, is automotive accidents uh, cases, well, um, it's easier when you're uh, cutting and pasting and using form interrogatories to just look for that particular answer in one place. Now, having said that, using the search function in Word, if you're preparing the document in Word, is really helpful. And so probably what I would do is do a search for so probably the word Houston and probably the word Sherman throughout the document. Or, or let, let's say this was the form that you were using and the car accident in your case was on West Austin Street in, you know, Denison, Texas. Well, you'd want to make sure you've purged all references to Sherman and all purge all references to this street. So it's good to do that global search to make sure you've, you've, you've caught them all. Because obviously, if you if you're asking them about an accident happened happening on a different street, they're gonna be like, ah, we don't know about that. Guess what? You ate up one of your 25 questions. So there you go. So you don't want to make that error. Here are some examples of interrogatories, and you can see how we're seeing the use of these defined terms, identify, you, the accident, these types of things. So um, obviously you won't need to have uh, definitions for terms that aren't being used. Now in, in the real world, they wouldn't be in, in red, they'd be just the ordinary color that you're using, but that's just to draw your attention to it. So let's look at interrogatory number one. Identify each person answering these questions, supplying information, or assisting in any way in the preparation of the answers to the interrogatories. But keep in mind when we say identify, we're not just giving the names. We have to do all of this stuff. So each one of those questions, we, for each one of those people, we have to do A, B, C, and D. Number two, identify any potential party to this lawsuit. Number three, identify all healthcare providers. Yeah, 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 going back. And again, the word identify has the particular meaning that we've already established in the definitions. So these are good examples of form interrogatories. You would cut and paste these into the document. And you can see these are written in such a way that we really are not going to have to clean them up. And that's one of the benefits, honestly, of using you. So you don't have to worry as much about the he, she pronoun issue if you're using you. Here we have a contention one. And again, you might want to define the term contention or opinion. That might have been a smart approach to use. So in interrogatory six, if you contend the defendant breached any duty of care in connection with the accident, state the facts that support your contention. Then here we have a fairly specific, this is our first interrogatory that is, is kind of specific to the facts of our case, at least in this list. With respect to the time of the accident, state the following, the rate of speed at which you were traveling at the time of impact with defendant's vehicle, your intended destination, and whether you had ingested any alcohol, beverages, or drugs during the 24-hour period immediately preceding the accident, and if so, the type and amount or dosage of each such beverage and or drug ingested, and whether you were wearing corrective lenses. So those would be examples of interrogatories. So this obviously would be specific to a car accident case. If you're using draft interrogatories and um, your case is a slip and fall at the department store, you won't want to inadvertently include this and then eat up one of your 25 interrogatories. Okay, so we've been acting at this point that you're the person asking the questions and that's going to be your role half the time, but of course the other half of the time you're going to be the person answering the other guy's questions. So let's look at that process. Um, so once you get the interrogatories from the other side, you're going to first, before you do anything else, you're going to calculate the deadline. 
you're going to calendar it. And let's say, if, again, if you receive it through the mail, you'll look to see um, the date that it was sent. And again, if you didn't get it hand delivered, you're probably going to be adding 33 days from the date that it was sent, not the date that you received it. And that'll be the due date. But of course, you're not just going to calendar that date because if you wait until the date that it's due to um, uh, start thinking about it, well, most cases you're sunk because there's going to be a lot of effort that you're going to have to do before it's ready to be completed. And of course, you're going to get, need to get the client to sign it in front of a notary and get it to the other guy. So it would be a rare circumstance that it would be possible to do all of that in one day. Um, and in fact, um, I've worked on interrogatories that, that from the date that it walked into my office until the date that we had to provide the response, uh, there were groups of people working full time on getting that information in the right form and gathered. It can take quite a bit of time, especially if there's a lot of electronic data that has to be recovered, restored, organized, processed, interpreted, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and you can't just do that on a dime. Sometimes uh, various systems, uh, data can only be gathered at certain cycles of the month where certain data is available or it's at least um, more less expensive to do it on a schedule like that and then you have to uh, submit the request within a particular period of time and sometimes the request doesn't work out the way you hope it will so sometimes you have to do a second request and so it's better to get started from the very very beginning and so it's likely that you'll have several different dates tickled here you as you meet with IT you might say okay well we need to make sure we get the data by this date okay so that's one tickler date and then we've got to get the data got to process and get this thing accomplished by this date and so that 33 or 30 day window needs to be broken down into much bigger components of course you're going to want to send the request to both the supervising attorney and the client obviously if it's a human being as a client that's pretty easy to do if it's an entity who is the client then you have to think well who is the client for this purpose if it's unclear of course you're going to want to talk to supervising attorney many times it's pretty logical who who is going to be helping you and of course when you contact the client really the client is being contacted for kind of two purposes one is obviously you always want to keep your client informed about the case um, and so you're informing him in his role as client the second is he's a source of information he's probably going to be signing the interrogatories and he's going to be the person who's going to be providing a lot of the data so if you are representing the client say it's a corporation um, the client is probably going to be lots of different people Client's going to be someone from IT, someone maybe from HR, somebody maybe from accounting, somebody maybe from different departments. So lots of people sent us from those departments. And so you may want to think about who needs to get it right away, who needs to get it soon, who needs to have it for FYI purposes, who needs it for actual getting data purposes. And of course, you don't just send it to the client, you have to put it within a context. If you send it to someone in IT, they will be like, I don't even know what this is, I don't know what to do with it. Why are you sending it to me? So it may uh, be something you send and then you sit down and say, let's talk about it. How, which pieces of this puzzle can you help with? And of course, this involves um, you know, walking them through the terminology, walking them through the legal requirements and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so you've, you've um, calendared everything, you've given it to the right people, what's your next step? And again, all this stuff, you, you don't really have the luxury of waiting especially if, if you're working for a large corporation and they're asking questions that hit on various different data points. You need to be doing this, you know, within, um, within on the same day, but certainly not, not much later than that. Uh, if you're representing, say, the plaintiff who's an individual, it might not be nearly as burdensome to do that, but it could be that the plaintiff um, will have to dig through lots of boxes to find the data. And so you shouldn't assume it's going to all be immediately available. So what are we going to do? What do we need to do once we've done our first two tasks? We're going to examine each one of the questions, and we're going to determine is there anything objectionable about it. So we're thinking about possible objections. Now, the attorney is going to have to sign off on our objections, but it's useful to think in those terms, and you will probably have some form of objections that you um, routinely slide into questions and so those may be useful ones to slide into. I mean, certain ones you're not going to want to object to because it's obvious. Well, yeah, of course we're going to ask that. And you might just tick people off if you object to those. But uh, it's very, very common for, you know, most questions to start with some objections. Then um, as you're going through and answering, you know, to decide kind of the scope of the answer. Again, if the interrogatory asks for 100 years, 
um, talk to the attorney, well, what do you think is reasonable under these facts? You know, I'm thinking five years may be reasonable. Then the attorney can say, well, yes, I, I agree with you, or let's do seven years. And so you don't want to have gathered the data for the three years and then turn around and the attorney says, oh, no, I think we ought to provide five years. Well, you're your IT person is not going to be your friend if they have to go back and collect more data. On the other hand, you don't want to request data for seven years and then the attorney say, oh, we only need it for five. If you've got the data for seven years, you have a much harder argument for saying it's overly broad and unduly burdensome when, guess what? You had the data. You had already gathered the data. The expense had already been spent. And so you want to be careful. You don't want to gather more data than you're going to actually provide in a response because then you're stuck. And it's going to be a much more hard argument to say, well, we only provided five years even though we actually did our internal searches for seven years. So you want to have these conversations with the attorney relatively early on. Okay, of course, you're going to be talking with the client. And again, the client can be lots of different people or perhaps one person and asking them to start answering the questions. Um, and then again, addressing the objections and the answers. Um, even though the client is going to be signing them, um, the attorneys and the paralegals are the ones who actually draft the answers for the most part. Now, you'll get notes from the client where the client will you know, give you some ideas, some facts, but it'll be your wordsmithing that actually goes into the answers and the objections. Okay, so once you've gotten an approved version from the attorney, again, this is still a draft stage, then you send it to the client to let him or her make sure, yeah, I've got the, got the facts straight. So the client's going to approve it, and now uh, you have them all lovely and done up, and now they're, we're going to have the client sign the sheet before a notary to get that um, uh, resolved. Um, and then you serve that complete package of course, the attorney also signs, um, uh, you know, in the subscription area. And his, his signature or her signature is going to be with respect to the um, objections. And so then you send it to all of the other attorneys. Obviously, the requesting attorney, yeah, that's pretty clear, but not just the requesting attorney, to all other attorneys on the case. And if somebody is pro se, then that party as well. So again, we're going to use that same caption we talked about before. So again, you're, once you uh, start a case, you're going to have this, you know, as a template in your system, and you'll just be able to pull it out every time. You're not going to want to retype this again and again. And then you can see here, um, didn't talk about this before, but, but the same ordering that we had. Actually, let me go back to our first set here. Yeah, here we have, so remember the, the, the three-part uh, naming convention we have, we, we say who this is from, so there's only one defendant, of course, so we want to specify the defendant, what the actual document is, this is the document, and is this the first, second, third, that type of thing. So we have one, two, three zones. Well, let's look at our answer here. We have the same three zones. Actually, we, we are only using two zones here. We have the plaintiff. Again, there's only one plaintiff. And then this is the name of this document. There's really no need to say first, though, in this case. I mean, it's implied because this is the only response the plaintiff is going to make. I suppose if the plaintiff makes a response but then decides to supplement it sometime, we might say uh, plaintiff supplemental objections and answers to defendants or first supplemental uh, but at this point, they did not say, and it's not common to, so this is the, the normal way. So for this one, we're only going to have two zones. Um, again, we have the signature block. The signature here is about um, what this signature here from Senior V Partner is going to be um, about the objections and, and also about kind of the data collection process. This is especially important. I mean, so we always need the signature, so it's not especially important in this case. It's a requirement all the time, but um, 
when you have a corporation because again the person who signed the verification may only have first-hand knowledge of a relatively small amount of the facts I mean um, I've been involved in interrogatories where you know we look at the person who probably has the most command of the information but he may he or she may only have 10 percent and so the other 90 percent a kind of no one is is verifying and, and no one has to verify under those circumstances but you want to make sure that you have a robust system in place to collect all that data and so this signature is is also going to that answer too it's kind of a rule 11 issue from that perspective okay so let's look at the process that we're going to follow to prepare those objections okay well so the first thing you're going to do is you are going to make any objections to the uh, instructions and definitions and you probably will and again you're going to have some form uh, this let's look at this one so here we have um, uh, plaintiff objects to instruction to because it exceeds a responding party burden under the federal civil procedure a plaintiff objects to definition one because it is overly overbroad and they say overly broad but you, very commonly kind of a term of art is overly broad and unduly burdensome and not reasonably calculated to lead to the discovery of relevant or admissible evidence that's kind of a, a, a can phrase that most of us could could say in our sleep a very common way of phrasing it so we're going to object to the definitions and um, instructions and then we're going to dive into the actual interrogatories and here we have an objection and typically you lead with the objection you make the right not typically you always lead with the objection you make the objection first and then you provide the answer plaintiff objects because the question is not relevant to any party's claims or defense and is, is not proportional to the needs of the case you may recall we talked about this requirement in um, I think it was lecture number two and you will we'll see in the answer um, so we see the question was last 20 years we'll see the answer provided here subject to and that way in the objective plaintiff's response he has received no citation for moving traffic violation in the last 10 years now you might be thinking well this objection it, gosh it probably means that the plaintiff got a moving citation uh, 10 and a half years ago does not necessarily mean that at all the plaintiff may never have had a moving uh, violation in the last 20 years so the fact that he objects does not necessarily mean that there's something he's hiding I mean it could mean that certainly that's a possibility but you shouldn't read more into the answers than are there um, you shouldn't look at that and go ha oh, there must be something juicy that's 11 years ago um, now I suppose if the plaintiff said in the last 11 years or something that might make you think oh it must be 12 but when especially when a, a, a number like 10 is used I think that is not a reflection that there's necessarily anything that just happened outside of the window but it's just a reflection that this is too long of a period of time obviously if the parties ask more than 25 questions without an agreement between the parties or a court order then you can object based upon the number plaintiff objects because the number of interrogatories including discrete subparts in this set exceeds the maximum number allowed under federal civil procedure so let's look at uh, the process who must prepare the facts set forth the interrogatories the human party in other words if the, a human being is named or the agent or entity of the party to whom the in interrogatories are directed but even though they um, are the ones who are going to swear the verification and help in the fact gathering the drafter is going to be the attorney or the paralegal it's best to use third person and not say I or we um, that's especially important if you're dealing with an entity like a corporation so you would say um, Exxon Corporation da, 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 not we or it um, well you could say it it would be fine but you don't want to um, you want to talk in the third person to the extent not objected to so again if you, you don't make an objection then so I'm not gonna provide any other information the only time that you make an objection and don't provide any information is that um, it, if it is your good faith belief that your objection renders the entire question uh, outside of the uh, scope of pro appropriate discovery that's the only time that you do that but if it is your opinion that there is some aspect of the question that do, that does is relevant to reasonable discovery 
then you always have to provide that information. So the part you're going to answer, you have to answer fully under oath and in writing. There needs to be a reasonable investigation. So you can't just say, well, uh, we don't know the answer to that question. Um, in a corporation, uh, uh, you, it's, it's anyone in the corporation that has that data or has access to that data. So um, it might be, let's say, somebody is filing an employment discrimination case and they're wanting all the documents in the personnel file for the last, you know, 25 years. Well, you, you might have a paper file somewhere in the office, but there are some archive files and some dusty server that's been archived um, and the system is now um, defunct and it's going to be a lot of effort to revive that data and has questionable utility. Well, you know what? You're probably going to have to at least investigate it. Even if you decide you don't have to produce that data, um, you're going to want to do some investigation to see, well, how expensive would it be to retrieve the data? How hard would it be? Is it even retrievable? Is it recoverable? Um, and, and those types of questions, because it's very likely that they will, that the other side will say, well, you, you ought, you needed to provide that data. Well, if it ends up that it would have been super easy for you to provide it and you didn't, that might be a bad fact for you. But if it ends up that it was quite difficult and you've done your due diligence to find out, ah, you know, we would have had to hire this person and this person and they would have had to work this many hours and it would have been this expense. And after all, the data that's in there, uh, the types of data that's in there really wouldn't be that useful to the case. You, you want to be able to build that case um, and, and now is the time to do it because now is the time you have to decide whether you're going to actually take those steps or not. Um, sometimes it's not possible to get information in time. For example, you might have an interrogatory asking for the names of any expert witnesses you're going to use. Well, maybe you haven't finalized that process yet. So you can truthfully say, no, we don't have any or or list only the ones that you already have. But let's say at some later time you decide uh, you've identified some that you are going to now use. Well, then you have to supplement um, as, as, I mean, not within moments of making that decision, but within a reasonable time period, certainly within a few days of um, when you have found that person. You don't have to keep on providing the same information. Sometimes interrogatories, especially given the fact that we have those initial inquiries under a Rule 26, and then we have a request, you know, the interrogatories that, that are unique to each case. Um, if you feel like an interrogatory uh, that you're receiving is actually duplicative of information that's provided in um, the, the uh, automatic interrogatories, then certainly you can refer to those particular sections. Sometimes you don't have enough information to provide a dis definitive answer on something, but you have some information or you have some suspicion about something. So you can then say, on information and belief, we think that this particular thing is true. That might be relevant, for example, to information that you think is on a particular server, but it'd be very expensive and, uh, to retrieve that. You might say, on information and belief, we think this is all just old time records but you haven't actually seen them. No one has seen them, but that is your understanding of the data that's in there. Well, that might be appropriate to call it information and belief versus saying we know what's on there. You don't want to volunteer information that goes beyond the scope of their question. Um, on the other hand, you don't want to provide um, less information. You don't want to be incomplete in your answers because you have the duty to fully answer the questions. Uh, so if you get to a point that you are trying to debate, well, what would be a full answer that's not overly full? Be sure to talk to the attorney about that because, again, it can be sanctioned. So let's say um, they request um, uh, a certain level of information, you make an objection overly broad and unduly burdensome, you provide a, a smaller data set, um, but perhaps the way you say it implies you're providing more, a larger data set than you are. That is not a good thing. You want to make sure that uh, what you're providing, you're making it very clear um, the, the, the extent of the data that, that you're making available to the other side. So here is, um, you know, so we talked about how, how we're going to 
answer. We're first of all going to uh, make that objection and then we're actually going to answer. We can see this first interrogatory, there is actually no objection. So the first interrogatory is identify each person answering these interrogatories, supplying information or assisting any way in the preparation of these interrogatories. And we see the client's name. There's no objection because this question is very reasonable and we can say with the assistance of counsel. It wouldn't be necessary to go through all of the people who um, were on Buford T. Justice's legal team. The paralegal, there might be multiple attorneys. That really goes to attorney work product and things along those lines beyond the scope. So I could see a person actually making an objection, a uh, cause for um, uh, attorney client privilege information that type of thing uh, but this would be a good risk good response and you can see how in the interrogatories typically the person is going to respond by typing in the interrogatory itself um, just as it appears in the document that you receive from the law firm this might be a good task for uh, the receptionist or the secretary to do um, also there can be uh, programs that you can um, uh, scan it in and it will put it into Word. Also, the uh, other side may send you a copy of the document in a Word file so you don't have to reinvent the wheel um, in terms of typing. But somebody needs to type this in and then below each answer, excuse me, below each question, you'll have the answer. Identify any potential party to this lawsuit. Plaintiff is unaware of any potential parties at this time. Again, there's no valid objection to that particular question, so there is no objection. Okay, there is an, op oh, so this is, so let's talk about the option of actually producing the business records instead of providing a narrative answer. This you may recall is at the end of Rule 33, so let's flip back to um, the rule. And here we have this section right here. This is at the section that we were saving for now. Um, option to produce business records, and that is instead of providing a narrative. When we say narrative, when I hear the word narrative, I think story, like, you know, it's a fictional account. But obviously in this situation, we're not <laughs> making fiction. We're telling what really happened, um, at least as far as we understand it. So a narrative is when you're using a kind of story technique, I guess you could say, but telling a truthful story. So a narrative, for example, of your life might be you were born on this day to your mother and your father and you grew up in this house and you went to this school and da da da. All of the events, that's the narrative of your life, typically presented in a you know, chronological order. It's all truthful, so it's not a narrative in the sense of it's fictional, but it's, it's a, a recounting of facts in a story format. And uh, that obviously takes effort. And so why tell a story about documents when, when you can actually provide the documents? Now, sometimes you have to do both because a document on its face may not say who actually received it or who created it or when it was created or how it was revised or all those specifics. But it, it does provide a lot of that information. So here we have the alternative of producing business records. If the answer to an interrogatory may be determined by examining, auditing, compiling, abstracting, or summarizing the party's business records, including ESI, electronically stored information, and if the burden of deriving or ascertaining the answer will be substantially the same for either party, the responding party may answer by, and we see it's substantially the same. This, what we're getting at here is the form of the data. It might be that a particular software is needed to analyze this data. Um, the party who has that system has the software, but the party who's propounding the discovery doesn't have the software. Um, and so that might be a situation where the cost wouldn't be substantially same to send the, that data to the other side because they're now have, going to have to go out and buy that software. But let's assume that's not the case. The party may answer by specifying the records that must be reviewed and giving the uh, person asking the questions a reasonable opportunity to examine those records. So that's an alternative to responding with the narrative. So let's go back to... our PowerPoint. This option is appropriate if the answer may be determined by looking at the business records and the burden is substantially the same. So it's just what we talked about in the last um, on the power, in the uh, rule. 
And here are the two steps that we also saw in that rule, rule 33D. So this is just a summary of that rule. So here's an example of how you might actually answer that question if you're taking advantage of that option. Defendant declines to provide a narrative answer to this interrogatory because the interrogatory asks for information that is available from its business or electronically stored records, namely the non-privileged logs, emails, and paper correspondence contained in defendant's claim file. And here's their citation to that same record we just wrote, that same rule that we were just looking at. Because the, de de the burden of deriving the answer is substantially the same, so you can see, boy, they're just cutting and pasting the language from the rule. Substantially the same for both parties, and because defendant has sufficiently specified the records, again, another requirement of that rule, so the plaintiff can identify the records as easily as defendant can, defendantly will make the responsive, non-privileged portions of his claim file available for inspection and or copying. So you can see when you're making an objection or doing something according to the rules, really just cut and paste the rules. You borrow that language from it. You don't need to put it in quotes. It's pretty obvious in the context that you are taking that language. This would be a great um, answer to have in your forms file. So every time you are electing to use this option, you don't have to rewrite this language. You can take it and just stick it in there again. Making, you know, if you're representing the plaintiff in the case and you're answering this question, you would switch out defendant for plaintiff and things along those lines. You may want to check the rule to make sure it hasn't been amended since then, but this is a, a good, good approach to answering that type of question. Okay, so let's talk about that verification page. This is the sworn page where the client is going to sign. Um, obviously, the factual answers, not the objections, are sworn to, and the person signing um, must have personal knowledge of the facts set forth in the interrogatory answers. Again, though, no, if you're representing a big corporation, no person is going to have personal knowledge of all that information. Um, and it must be signed before a notary public. This is a sworn statement subject to the pains and penalties of perjury, so it's not something to be approached lightly. And here's an example of what you might have. Now you can see that this verification is not necessarily going to have the, and this is going to be a separate page, but it's not necessarily going to have the caption. You can have a caption, that's fine, but in this case they chose not to have a caption. This is a pretty common format for a verification or an affidavit. In this situation, verification, same thing as an affidavit. You can see that this is the particular location uh, that Mr. Buford T. Justice was in at the time that he signed. He was in Grayson County. That's where the notary is. We can see the notary stamp right here. Before me, the undersigned notary, this guy. On this day, personally appeared Buford T. Justice, this guy. The affiant, that's just the person who is signing the affidavit. A person whose identity is known to me. Well, how did the notary know Buford T. Justice? Well, probably Buford T. Justice pulled out his driver's license. I mean, they may have personally known each other beforehand. That would also be fine. But that's a pretty common way. It's very likely that the notary has some kind of log that he maintains of all the times that he notarizes a signature. And it's pretty common under those circumstances to request a driver's license number or passport number or something along those lines from the person, sometimes even if you already know the person. And then it's pretty common for the notary to actually uh, write out the, the name, maybe the uh, personal address of the person, and then have the uh, have Buford T. Justice sign in his log as all, and also sign the verification. After I administered an oath, Affiant testifies as follows. My name is Buford T. Justice. I have read the foregoing answers to defendant's first set of interrogatories. The answers stated in them are within my personal knowledge and are true and correct. And the Buford T. Justice signs here. Usually the person doesn't literally read it. It's, it this is fine. Uh, this is testimony for him to sign um, for this quote. And you can see the date of the state signature. You might find there's a blank here and that notary actually writes in that particular date. That's also fine. So you have propounded discovery and now you've gotten the responses back from the other side. You're looking them over at this point. What do they have to say? Well, let's see about the things that you're looking for as the uh, paralegal. Okay, so you're going to review the answers and objections. You're going to notice, hey, do any seem incomplete, evasive, or non-responsive? If you find that they are, obviously you're going to want to bring them to the attention of your attorney. 
very likely then the attorney will contact the other side and say, hey, we feel like this answer is incomplete if the attorney agrees with you. And then uh, and sometimes the other attorney will say, oh yeah, you're right, I, I should have provided more, and he then promptly provides more. Um, that's fine. Uh, but sometimes the parties cannot reach an agreement about what ought to be provided, so a motion to compel may be necessary. And the attorney may ask you to draft up that motion to compel. And obviously it's a motion, so it's going to be to the court. Um, and again, some federal judges handle their own discovery disputes. Pretty commonly the, the U.S. magistrate judge will handle the dispute instead. Um, but, you know, it's going to be in the litigation file, so you don't want to file frivolous motions and you don't want to um, respond in a way that's not appropriate. Because this is a contested motion um, saying basically, hey, the other side's not doing what they're supposed to. Tell them to, to behave, basically, is what you're doing. You're going to need for this type of motion a certificate of conference saying, hey, uh, and again, the attorney's going to do this. I, I contacted the other side. Um, he refused to uh, resolve the matter. So we need to go to you to make sure everything is, is in good shape. Uh, we've talked about Rule 11 a lot, but this is the equivalent of Rule 11 for the purposes of discovery. So I'm going to flip over and just show, show this to you for a second. This is how the judge might decide to find um, that there is something sanctionable. Um, so let's just go ahead and pull that up here for a second. I'm going to go back to the Federal Civil Procedure. We're going to go down to Rule 37, a motion for an order compelling discovery, disclosure or discovery. And again, here we have um, motion to compel discover, disclosure, motion to, of course, this has to do with the automatic disclosures. Uh, motion to compel discovery response, this is when it's in response to a particular question. You can see there's a whole range of things here. If the motion is granted, so this is, you file the motion to compel, the magistrate judge or the federal judge has granted your motion. So if that motion is granted, The court must, after giving an opportunity to be heard, require the party or deponent whose conduct necessitated the motion, the party or attorney advising that conduct, or both, to pay the movement's reasonable expenses. So if you ended up spending $2,000 to file that motion to compel, and you win it, the other side has to pay your legal expenses. But the court must not order this payment if the movement filed the motion before attempting a good in good faith to obtain the disclosure. So you, you didn't do the certificate of conference requirement. And the um, opposing party's non-disclosure is substantially justified. So for example, let's say um, we requested 100 years of data. The other guy provided five years of data. The court says, well, I think six years would have been appropriate. Well. Um, you know, reasonable people can differ about five or six years. It's very likely the court would say your, your request for 100 years was really unreasonable. Uh, where the other side came down wasn't completely where I thought they ought to be, but they were closer to being right than you. Or other circumstances make an award of expenses unjust. And that could be because of a very different uh, financial positions of the parties. But it's certainly something that in a motion to compel is, is routinely requested and is sought um, because it's, you know, money. <laughs> you want as much as you can, and you also want to motivate the other side to um, play by the rules. If you have any questions, please uh, bring them to class. Be delighted to talk about them in more detail at that time. Thank you for your attention, and have a great day.